Okay, we're going to uh, begin our panel discussion. So our panel is going to talk about opportunities to improve nutrition, and they're going to give us the perspectives from the street. So I'd like to first introduce Shannon Dorham. She's the CEO of YMCA Calgary, and Shannon has dedicated her career to community service, leadership, and social change, and she's going to come give us an overview of her agency and their initiatives. Thank you. Well, good evening. I know I'm the one, well, one of three things standing between you and the end of the night, so I'm going to do my best to uh, talk to you a little bit about the, what the YMCA is up to and how it actually connects full circle to uh, some of the things that we've heard about tonight. So thank you, Raylene. Uh, so really my goal tonight is to offer the perspective of an organization that lives and breathes community development. We are on the front lines of public health in Canada and have a very important role in creating healthy environments delivering health-promoting services, and inspiring wellness in body, mind, and spirit, which is what you might know us for. But perhaps you haven't thought of the YMCA as an actor in this space. We are actually the world's largest and oldest youth charity, and we play a critical role in advancing public health efforts. Our teams are out there providing critical hours programming, a safe environment for children. We also teach English language instruction from newcomers. We provide culturally inspired Indigenous programs for youth. We connect nature to kids through outdoor programming and leadership opportunities. We also run childcare with curriculums that are set to give children the best possible foundation and tools for a healthy life. We do all of this in addition to running fitness centers and teaching swimming lessons, which is probably what you know us for. Our aspiration as a YMCA is that Calgarians are healthy, vibrant, and connected. Our team of more than 3,000 staff and volunteers aim to do this in four ways. The first is to enable lifelong healthy living. The second, to advance positive child, youth, and family development. Next, we aim to cultivate social and emotional well-being. And last but not least, we strive to foster community building, an element of wellness that is so critical to our sense of belonging. So with this in mind, I hope to introduce you to how the YMCA develops healthy food environments, creates opportunities to teach children about nutrition and physical activity, and describe a little bit about healthy food policies show up in our day-to-day -day operations. So I've chosen to highlight just a couple of areas. We have a, a broad spectrum of services, as you might know. But the first is our licensed child care, and, and Kim spoke a little bit about this. Uh, the YMCA in Calgary will soon operate seven licensed child care centers, and they range in size from 40 spaces to 348 spaces, uh, which is like a small elementary school. But in these centers, food preparation and services are actually mandated by Alberta Health Services, and we do follow the nutrition guidelines for children and youth in these centers. And really in practice, what this means, and I chose to pull out a couple that I think are really important, and our staff make sure that 100% of foods available for regular consumption should be from the choose most often category and I think that's actually a really important point because it, it defines what we put into the fridges and then onto the plates so I think that's an important point. Our child care providers assign appropriate times and spaces to eat. Uh, they choose options from each of the four food groups and lastly the serving sizes are to be consistent with the food guide and these are all important practices that the nutrition guidelines would say are really critical to helping our little ones succeed. But in addition to the licensing regulations, our providers also do their best to ensure that children are educated about food, including where their food comes from. At our Cory Park location, we've developed what's called an experience studio. And it allows the children to experiment with healthy recipes and to be involved in creating the food that they eat. So over the summer, they actually grow their own gardens out in what we call the backyard. Um, and it helps them understand the pathway uh, from the dirt to the oven to their tummies. And some of our most positive feedback actually comes from this concept, which is teaching kids from a very young age where food comes from. The next example I wanted to share is something we're actually very, very proud of. And many of you will know that there's a YMCA in the South Health campus. And this is a space known as the Wellness Centre. And what you might not know is that it's actually the first of its kind in Canada. And it includes a teaching kitchen. And that was a very intentional part of, of this uh, facility that opened in 2012. So since our partnership began in 2012, we've taught hundreds of combined physical activity and nutrition courses in this space. We've successfully piloted chronic disease programming, in, so including some that are condition specific. We've offered day camps that include cooking experiences for kids. And we've also worked with the Pediatric Centre for Weight and Health to help overweight and obese youth find activities they enjoy and learn about food and nutrition. 
There's actually one important part about the story that I think is really interesting, and, and I risk that saying in a room full of academics. Um, this partnership wouldn't have been uh, doable without the political will and the influence of some really important community leaders. And one of them said, we're not going to study this, this being the idea of a YMCA in a hospital. We're just going to do it, because if we don't just do it, it will never happen. And so here I stand today in front of you five years into a partnership that has been absolutely tremendous, and I'm glad we didn't study it because we're doing it. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, so it, it has forever changed the way I think about uh, innovation in health promotion, and I think it, it teaches us some really important lessons. So, uh, just a couple of things I want to close with. Uh, the generation of children and youth we're seeing at the YMCA today often have no idea where their food comes from. Uh, this probably doesn't surprise you. They've never seen a garden, many of them. Some of them have never seen a farm or a farm animal. Um, and so we have quite a hill to climb when it comes to helping children and families uh, actually create healthy food environments and food environments at home. Uh, but what we're trying to do in the Y is make sure that foods come um, from anywhere other than a box or a can, that everything we, we serve in our facilities is as fresh as it possibly can. Be, but we're also trying to teach a generation of parents that is trapped for time um, how we can support them. So we have a very great opportunity, I think, as a frontline on the street provider um, that, that's trying our best to contribute to this and be part of that conversation. So uh, I look forward to the dialogue afterward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shannon. Uh, our next panel member is Erin Gionne. Uh, she's a health promotion specialist with the Alex Community Food Centre in Calgary, a facilitator trainer with Community, Community Food Centres Canada, and a passionate advocate for good food as a means to build health, dignity, skills, and community. Good evening. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this panel. It's amazing to be in a room with so many like-minded people. It's really, really inspiring, and I'm super excited to be here with all of you. Um, the Alex Community Food Centre is located on 17th Avenue Southeast in the heart of Forest Lawn, and our street is called International Avenue. It's a welcoming place where community members come together to grow, cook, share, and advocate for good food. The Community Food Centre provides people with access to high quality food in a dignified setting through healthy meals and skill-based programming. Folks can learn to cook gardening and, or cooking and gardening skills in ways that expand their taste buds and help them to make healthier food choices. People make friends, connect to community supports, find their voices on the issues that matter to them. Community food centers offer multifaceted, integrated and responsive programming in a shared space where food builds health, hope, skills and community. The Alex Community Food Center was established in 2016 as a collaboration between the Alex Community Health Center here in Calgary, which many of you may know, been established for over 40 years and our national partner, Community Food Centres Canada. And together, we envision a future where everyone has the means and knowledge to access good, healthy food in a dignified way, and the ability and opportunity to be heard on the food issues that affect all of us. We envision a robust, diverse food economy that sustains farmers and the land, and a social consensus that food is a key determinant of health and a public good. So that's the big picture of what the Alex Community Food Centre is and what happens there. So I'd like to tell you a little bit more about my role and how it informs the question that we're discussing this evening. Our work at Community Food Centres Canada is grounded in three areas. Healthy food access, healthy food skills, and education and engagement. These elements are foundational to the program that I facilitate, which is called Food Fit. And I know that some of the registered dietitians in the room have been guests with our program. It's great to see you here. Food Fit is a 12-week commitment-based program designed for people who are motivated to make healthy changes, but might not have access to other resources in the community, such as cooking classes and gym memberships. 
Like all of our programs, Food Fit is targeted at folks who are living on a low income with a small food budget. So there's no charge to participants. It's made possible by generous funding from the Public Health Agency of Canada's multi-sectoral grants program and matching funds from other sources. The Food Fit program has been offered in 17 communities across the country from Vancouver Island to Nova Scotia. It's a two-year grant period, so there are 11 programs currently running. Food Fit was developed with the support of a physician, registered dietitian, and exercise physiologist. Many of our participants are living with chronic illnesses such as obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease and arthritis, among other things. Many also face significant challenges due to mental illness and physical or developmental disabilities. What's key is that most of our participants struggle with poverty and lack of access to adequate food, housing, and other basic needs. For all of these reasons, it's important that Food Fit is a welcoming place for people of all ages, stages, abilities, and cultural backgrounds. We meet people where they are and encourage folks to do the best they can with the resources they have. We recognize that everyone comes with their own skills and each individual has something to offer. Every week we get together to learn about a different aspect of healthy eating, such as cooking with whole grains or legumes, making soups and stews, shopping healthy on a budget. We prepare a meal around the theme for that week and while our meal's cooking, we leave it in the hands of our trusty volunteers and we head out for a 30 minute walk outside. When we come back, we all sit down to enjoy our meal together, and then everyone helps clean up. And if you'll indulge me, um, I like this quote that I was reminded of recently. Anthony Bourdain once said, you learn a lot about someone when you share a meal together. And that's a really, really important part of what we do. It's incredibly inspiring to watch the transformation participants can experience in the 12 weeks we're together. While some of our participants have weight loss as a goal, we focus on building healthy habits for life and measure success in all kinds of different ways. Participants report feeling braver and more confident in the kitchen, healthier and more energetic, and perhaps most importantly, less socially isolated. Still others have noticed a marked improvement in their symptoms and actually reduced or eliminated their need for prescription medications. FoodFit's motto is eat healthier, move more, make new friends. I'm increasingly convinced that the third element is the most important. Without the sense of community, healthy eating and exercise wouldn't be nearly as effective. Participants may initially join FoodFit to get a healthy meal or learn some new skills in the kitchen, but it's the sense of community that we build together that keeps them coming back week after week and month after month as part of our alumni program. And actually, one of our alumni is speaking tomorrow at noon, Mary Salvani, and I encourage you to um, soak up what she has to say. With over 100 Food Fit graduates from our program at the Alex Community Food Center, many have gone on to become strong community volunteers and ambassadors. As one participant said, I feel that I'm important enough to take care of. Food Fit participants enjoy the recipes we create in class and want to eat food that makes them feel well. They can see what a difference it makes to their well-being, and the skills they learn in Food Fit go a long way towards helping them achieve better health. However, the biggest barrier most participants face is inadequate income to purchase and prepare healthy home-cooked meals. Without sufficient resources, people are unable to make the healthy choices they know will make them feel better, and that's no choice at all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erin. Um, and our third panel member is Eric Dulong. He chairs the P2 Patient and Family Advisory Panel at the Libin Cardiovascular Institute of Alberta and is a certified life coach. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Eric Dulong, and thank you for being here today. I'm very happy to, uh, to be part of this uh, important discussion about nutrition. Um, I have nothing to, to disclose. Maybe just I'm French, so I may skip some H. Maybe I will put an S somewhere and forget one somewhere else, so forgive me about that. 
Um, as uh, the father of modern medicine, Hippocrates said, and I believe he said that because I wasn't there, uh, let food be thy medicine and medicine be the food. I don't know how to pronounce that T-H-Y, but whatever. Let the food be your medicine and let the medicine be your food. So these words express the importance of uh, eating habit. So why am I speaking today? Um, you know, I'm not a specialist on like Dr. Campbell that said things that I was like, oh, I'm talking about that. That's awesome. Uh, so why am I speaking today? So I want to I bring a perspective on nutrition that goes beyond just what we eat, but how and why we eat what we eat. And my wish is for each of us to reflect on the place of nutrition in our overall well-being. So uh, before uh, we start, I will share a bit about me. So as uh, we mentioned, um, I am the chair of the new patient-oriented research panel at Liban Institute. Uh, it's led by the uh, inspiring and energetic Dr. Maria Santana. She's an assistant professor at O'Brien Institute of Public Health and director of the Method Hub. And we have the support also of Dr. Todd Anderson. Uh, it's a group that we're creating um, that patient work with, uh, with researchers, so it's very patient-oriented research. I'm also a certified life, co life coach by the International Coach Federation, so I support my client in making cho choices in their life to support their, well their overall well-being. So I want them to be in the driver's seat about their well-being. I personally had diabetes for over 22 years, and I still does. But however, by making a major change in my eating habits, I was able to stop taking insulin three months ago uh, after taking it for eight years. Uh, on the top of that, I shaved, I shaved some 30 pounds in five months. And also maintaining a respectable A1C cholesterol. So those are my personal health KPI key personal indicator, like corporation, I have that. So, you know, it's good. So that tells me, doctor says, you're doing a good thing, keep doing what you're doing. So I often hear my wife saying, you should eat this. They say it's good for you. And I say, who are they? And why they are saying that, right? I don't know, they say that, right? And I know she's there and she doesn't like when I say that because, you know, it's a little bit of a, well, uh, my brain is worried in a way that I'm a critical thinker, and uh, so, um, so, and it's a lot of work to rewire your brain to change, so I'm just the way I am. So um, I'm going to be that type of critical thinker. So um, in a more serious way, for most, most of us, knowing for sure what are healthy food choices or not is not that obvious. Um, Dr. Um, Campbell talked about a lot about that, but we're bombarded with advertisement touting something, the benefit on our health of this miracle superfood. We hear this product is good, that everyone should eat it. And then suddenly, well, maybe, yeah, we should maybe, uh, maybe what we thought was right, mm, it's not really accurate anymore, and maybe we should even avoid eating it. But for a long time we heard about that, and that was really good. Um, so it is difficult for us ordinary citizens to tell the true to the false between the science in the service of marketing versus the real science that is there for best interest, not just our wallet. And, uh, and also, uh, especially that occasionally some well-known organization may have some mystical economic agreement with some uh, players in the food industry, which can cause a soft focus that easily misguide the uh, unskilled eyes. So if you know photography, soft focus is kind of a little blur line, things are not clear, so that's, that's what it is. So, as a citizen, we must keep our critical look at the information shared with us. So how can we find a time to look for the true to the wrong when we have to manage an already well-booked day-to-day agenda, share between work, children, social life? So the marketing agency of this world knows that re really well, and their wishes is to sell us solutions to simplify our life. Do they? 
Day after day, new food hit the market, like Minute Food or that miracle bar that contains everything we need. And best of all, we still have one end free to answer our email while we're eating, right? That's awesome. But the perverse effect of this is that it brings the action of eating as a transactional level and not making eating as a conscious act that benefit our well-being. I must admit that I am pleased to learn that officially the food lobby was excluded from the discussion about the new nutrition principle in this recent uh, Canadian food guide. I hope it's still true, but that's what I heard. So that's good. And, but I'm, so I'm really curious because we had a little perspective about that, but not a lot of detail. So I'm really looking forward for that. But now I would like to look at nutrition using different lenses. As mentioned earlier, the food guide represents a category of food we should eat and how much we should eat in each category. Nutrition should also explore how we eat and why we eat. So let's look at those two other facets of nutrition. So I would like to share with all of you about this moment I experienced a few years ago. So one day I went on a seven days uh, silence meditation retreat in a Zen temple in the mountain of Washington state. And I had a eating experience there. It was the best experience in my life about food. So during that experience, the food was not just nourishing my stomach, but it was nourishing my soul. The taste, the texture, the smell, even the sound of the fork touching the middle bowl we had was amazing. It was a great experience. So, uh, and this is what we call mindfulness eating, meaning eating in full consciousness, being fully present when we are eating. And why this is important? Because our body truly knows that what is good for us or not. Taking the time to be fully connected with the moment of eating allows us to observe and deeply understand how the food we eat and how we eat the food make us feel. If I can take a concrete exam example, I read that it takes 20 minutes for your uh, stomach to send a message to your brain that you're full. So if I had a first plate, eat quick with two forks, and then two minutes after I have another one, and then the third one, it takes 20 minutes for the brain to say, uh, well, I was full, so I ate too much, and I'm feeling sick before that 20 minute. So taking the time to eat, uh, becoming aware of that is just as important as what you eat. If I take my time, savor my food, that all my intention on is on the action of eating. So, um, and then become, I, I become aware of what goes into my stomach and when I have enough of it. So how we integrate mindfulness eating in our day to day? First of all is eating real food just like cutting a real vegetable and, and, and cooking it. You know what's in it. Sitting in a park to eat. Eating in a staff room. Not eating and working at the same time. Sitting down to eat without television or phone. So not eating and texting and reading that. And sometimes I'm guilty of that. And my wife is looking at me and she knows that. And um, also making family eating time a precious in a unique moment. That's the, the time we can all connect together. We eat and we're connecting, we're connecting with the food. We're there and we're sharing that together. And otherwise, eating becomes a transaction to survive and not a conscious gesture of nourishing, nourishing one's body, one's soul, and taking care of oneself. Thank you. A question here, how can we spread and scale up the programs initiated by YMCA and the Alex. So how do we build upon your success to take it even broader and larger? <laughs> There's a lot of things packed into that question. <laughs> um, funding is always helpful, uh, which, which everyone can attest to. But I actually think one of the things that I really appreciate is just the opportunity to speak with you tonight, is to raise awareness about what each of us is trying to do. And it's an important social conversation like this that actually starts the social conscience around issues that are important to all of us. 
so I appreciate these opportunities. I would say at a very tactical and practical level, uh, we do our best uh, mm -hmm. as a vehicle to help promote and educate folks and provide opportunities. Uh, the YMCA is lesser known as a charity than it is as a place to go for gym and swim, and by doing that, we try and break down barriers, and I call it you know, the great social equalization, which means that everybody can participate regardless of your ability to pay. And so I think that's one fundamental way that uh, a charity like ours can actually play a really important role, which is making uh, those opportunities accessible for everybody. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's a little bit of a time delay here on the mic. Um, I think that's true, and being part of a national or an international organization is very helpful as well, and there's so much opportunity for organizations to collaborate um, and play to each other's strengths and, and work together in these areas, so I think that that's a, a great opportunity too. Um, and, and to your point as well, it, for us, we at Community Food Centers Canada um, and at the Alex, we like to talk about solidarity rather than charity. So we're walking hand in hand with people um, on their journeys and uh, they are active participants in that. And, and that's why it's not just about offering food access or food skills, but also the education and engagement piece so that people can, can take an active role in, uh, in improving their own situations. Great, thank you. We have another interesting question here. So, Please compare smaller North American homes, one or maybe two kids or single parent homes, versus families in poverty or recent immigrants where homes have many people and many generations. So maybe, you know, who do you see accessing your programs or are there differences in uh, what you see with these two different types of family structure and, and the size of the family unit? speak to that a little bit. Um, so I was asked to think about a question in terms of what are the challenges of providing nutrition to vulnerable populations and I'm not really crazy about that term because I think everybody has the opportunity to have agency to some degree in their own lives. Um, but to us vulnerable populations would include anyone who's having a difficult time finding room in their budget for healthy food and that reaches across all ages, stages, abilities, and cultural groups. And so um, I did look up a couple of statistics around that. Um, one I found was that approximately 4 million Canadians, or about 13% of the population, report that they don't know where their next meal is coming from or that they would give up a meal so that their child could eat. Um, if you're a person of color, indigenous, or a lone female parent, the numbers are much, much higher um, because one in six children live in a food insecure household in Canada. So that doesn't really, it's not determined by um, necessarily uh, your, your cultural group or anything like that, but there are certain groups who are, are more at risk of being food insecure. So I think just reaching out to, to everyone and making, making our spaces welcoming to everyone who, who needs a place to go. Mm -hmm. Good, thanks. Uh, do you have any, do you have any opportunities for groups to volunteer at your organizations? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, in, in all seriousness, uh, uh, we, we are a volunteer run organization. Of the 3,000 number that I gave you, about 1,600 of those are volunteers. Uh, they are the lifeblood, you are the lifeblood of our organization, so uh, certainly have room for many more, thank you. Always. Okay, <laughs> great. I don't have any emails coming in, um, and I don't have any more cue cards. Is there maybe uh, a question in the audience that uh, we could address or have? Yes, at the back. Could you speak loud so we can hear, please? The, the question is on proof of income and what, what how uh, do you have to provide proof of income to access some of these programs? Um, at the Alex Community Food Center, we don't require that. Um, it's really important for us to provide a dignified space. And so if community members tell us that they are living on a low income with a small food budget, we take their word for it. 
Yeah, I'll give, um, I'll give our perspective, which is slightly different. Uh, our goal is to be as inclusive as we can for all. Um, to give you a bit of perspective, we have just over 60,000 members of the YMCA in Calgary, so we do have a process um, to ensure fairness and, and equity and that the, the help is going uh, to those who need us the most. And so, but it, it is a system based on low-income cutoff. Uh, and we do have those discussions in the most um, integrity-driven way that we can. Excellent. Yes. Uh, uh, this is just a sort of a general question, but I, I've often thought that uh, once we once we had both parents working or often single parents as well, um, we now have children, early and mid teenagers, in the after school hours, and it seems to me like it's a resource that I hope everybody heard that because I think it's an excellent strategy. We, we should move forward with it. Kids in after school programs, if we teach them, give them the ability to uh, cook and you know prepare a nice healthy meal, then when uh, two parents, where we have homes with two parents working, come home to a wonderful, healthy, warm dinner meal. So. <laughs> then she came back and she was basically a uh, big Velasquez. Mm -hmm. She was a gourmet chef, but she'd been watching in the after school hours children's cooking shows. Right. Mm -hmm. And it really got her interested, and then it got into the nutritional side too. So mm -hmm. I, I, think it's a, I think it's a great resource we have. Yeah. And I think it brings up a really important point is that. Uh, most Canadians, particularly our younger generations, have, have lost the ability to cook a very basic meal from simple ingredients. So perhaps maybe just briefly the panel members could just comment on, you know, teaching these skills again. And, you know, obviously we'd like to start with the younger generations, but I, I think some of your programs are not just working with the children, but teaching all ages to get back in the kitchen and get these skills again, right? Well, um, I, I don't have a big organization. I have two kids and a wife, so <laughs> it's a small organization. We are all volunteering, and so it's a different perspective. But, um, yeah, kids love cooking. They are uh, aware, like, I'm at home, um, I have the the chance or I create that chance of working from home and I'm the cook at home and, um, and, and all they are like, you know, I remember before they were like, my youngest one was talking about how oh, McDonald was the best thing and, and it was kind of insulting for me cooking. But then now, you know, it was, it was Father's Day and, and someone, because I make homemade pizza and, and, and so they made a sign saying, you know, Papa Eric Pizza and like with my phone number and everything and they say you can eat really well at Papa Eric Pizza. And so we create how important it is to eat together and eat good food and I'm, I, I want to bring that awareness to them about what is real food. And, and at, at home, yes, it, you know, we try to buy organic milk. We try to buy that things because for me it's important. It's not only uh, the, the food but really the, the quality of it and, and, and the ethic, ethical about the production of that food. And, and the kids part, are, are part of that and they are aware and we have discussion about food while we are eating because it's important. It's, it's, it's part of, of that. So. That's the perspective of my small organization. Great, thank you. <laughs> we had a question come in. This is specifically for the Alex. Uh, how do you integrate medical needs that are a barrier to healthy metabolism or losing weight? So with a you know, variety of different medical needs, how do you integrate and work around that? Yeah, so that's one of the great things about being a partnership between the Alex Community Health Center which is our local partner here, and Community Food Centers Canada. So um, there's holistic wraparound care for folks with all different types of health and medical needs. So they can access the Alex Community Health Center. We have a youth health center, senior center. Uh, we have all kinds of different mental and physical health supports. Um, and then they can access the 
the food resources through the food center through food access if they need a meal or cooking classes where they can learn to prepare meals that are appropriate for their health and dietary needs. So it's really important to have that full wraparound care for folks who have particular health needs and challenges.